Kaleen has been a Kaleen has been a youth leader for over 15 years and is of the firm belief that when nurtured, mentored, and given the opportunity, young people are able to take the world by storm. Kaleen's personal vision for her life is that through her words, in whatever form they take, her aim is to encourage, educate, and enhance the lives of those around her. Currently, Kaleen is a certified emotional intelligence coach and the owner of Promise Jazz by Kel. You all need to get one of those. <laughs> Founded by Kaleen and her husband, Promise Jazz by Kel is a company whose mission is to help cultivate a future where everyone has the opportunity to access innovative products and services crafted by Kel that allow them to live a consistently empowered and fulfilling life. Lastly, she's an author, having released her first book entitled, Don't You Dare Back Down, Strategies for Overcoming Fear. Thank you, thank you, thank you for Kelly for being with us this evening. And we wanna invite our virtual space and Kelly, say hi to everyone before we get started. Good evening, ladies. Good evening, good evening. Thank you for having me here. Kelly, this are you excited? Time. I am excited? very excited. Oh, well, the devils are out. The devils are out. <laughs> <laughs> we have some fun this evening. Thank you, Colleen. This evening we have with us Tanya Ellis Osbury, who's a licensed professional counselor and certified professional. Let me move Colleen um, to get this on the screen. Nice. Good. She's a licensed professional counselor and a certified professional counselor supervisor. She has worked in the mental health sector for over 18 years and expanded her passion to serve individuals by opening up her first group private practice in 2017. She is now the proud owner and lead therapist of this thriving mental health practice, Challenging Perspective. Tanya provides counseling services for individual couples and families experiencing a wide range of mental health challenges. She also hosts workshops and other training sessions um, Tanya also holds a school counseling certification and have worked in the education sector as a school counselor. She's a published author of her first book, Impressions of the Mind, What You Think Matters, which can be found on Amazon. So go get those books, ladies. Tanya is married to a wonderful husband over 17 years. Their union produced three handsome kings, Zion, Malachi and Noah. Her goal is to empower individuals to actualize their full potential by being aware of their thoughts and challenging them. Ladies, we want to welcome to Trinidad and Tobago, Tanya. Please say hi to the audience. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I can't wait to delve into this panel discussion. <laughs> oh. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for being with us. Now we have Miss Shannon Fraser, who's 25 years of age, young Christian, I need to stop saying this young thing, you know. Yeah, young Christian woman on a mission from Barbados, a published author of The Purpose in Your Pain. You know, as I said that, I'm reminded I have my, my, my daughter, she's 19. I'm around younger women all the time and there is something about that age group that always have a pain let's find out if it's that mental pain or something is happening with them so purpose in your pain and a woman on a mission journal that's her two books a graduate nurse business woman speaker mental health advocate podcast host pastor additionally she's the founder of woman on a mission ministries where wisdom vision and purpose collide Let's welcome to the virtual space, Shannon Fraser. Shannon, could you say hi to everyone? Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Daniel, for having me. It's a blessing to be here among such great women. Blessing. Are you excited? Yes, I am. Good. Very good. And last but not least, we have the we have Nadij Honore Wellington, um, is a counseling psychologist and owner of Thriving Life Therapy Practice, hailing from Trinidad and Tobago. Anybody from Trinidad here? I am hailing from Trinidad and Tobago. 
She is passionate about helping women and teen girls regain control and step out from under the heaviness of anxiety and depression, build healthy relationships, and live happy, thriving lives. For the past 12 years, she has supported young women by providing counseling, psychoeducation, and mentoring, partly through Beauty and Essence, a nonprofit organization for young women, of which she was the founder. She has also supported young people as a guidance officer for several years. Mrs. Wellington graduated from the Siena College, Albany, New York, with a master's in mental, in master's in counseling, sorry, and psychology at the University of the Southern Caribbean. She's also a certified youth mental first aider. Her experiences as a national col colleague at Yes, national athlete, mentor, wife, mother, and friend have shown her that women are strong and resilient with the right support. Can you cheer on as we welcome to the stage? She's also a mummy, and I'm sure she has a lot to say this evening. Let's welcome to the stage Mrs. Wellington. I love, before she, before she says hi, I love this part. Her self-care includes feeding her soul, enjoying a good curry meal, and exercising, staying connected with loved one. Let's welcome, we don't have any curry in this space right now, but let's welcome Mrs. Wellington to our space. Good curry, Trinidad and Tobago curry, right? Good curry, so welcome. Hey Beth. <laughs> Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Daniel. I'm also very excited, so. Good, we're looking forward to it. So, I want to turn over to the very capable Miss Shadi Thompson. Shadi, I beg you, be easy on our guests this evening, please. No difficult no questions promises. that will throw I, them I, off I their really feet. No promises. You know, Miss Placid, one of the things that um, I forgot to send you in my bio, which I think is very important to note, because I feel like I'm in the presence of such experts, and I don't know if I could match up. But no, you know, you one of the well. things that I wanted to send you is that um, I am also a certified psychologist. I graduated from, you know, the University of Google in 20, I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but um, I, I <laughs> All right, so let's, <laughs> let's, let's jump get it right you. into it. So uh, the first question I will um, ask Mrs. Asbury is for <clears throat> is how do you find how do you define mental health and mental illness mental health is um comprised of our um, emotional our social and our psychological state um and this affects the way we make decisions it affects the way we think it affects the way we feel um, and the way we we behave or act um, and mental illness is when our emotional um, our social and our psychological and or our psychological state is or are compromised. Um, and just like physical illness, which shows up in our bodies as symptoms, mental illness has symptoms that shows up as well. Um, so if you have diabetes, like, you know, it shows up with like fainting spells and things like that. If you have mental illness, it shows up in uh, maybe sadness, isolation, um, uh, suicidal thoughts, like just different things that are like negative impacts um, of that of that illness. And you may see it in, your, in the way you think and in the way that you act or behave. Wow. I think that's that's very interesting that you jumped right into the symptoms because one of the questions I was going to ask and, you know, someone sent us is how do we, how can we tell if we're struggling with mental health? Is it something that someone always has to tell us or are there signs that we can see for ourselves knowing that we're struggling you know, with our mental health? Yes, there are definitely signs that you can, you know, notice on your own. Like, for example, if you notice that you're isolating or you're like have poor appetite, um, whether it's eating too much or not eating enough, um, or if you're like losing sleep, like you're sleeping too much or sleep, sleep, sleeping too little, um, you're easily irritated or angered, different things like that, you can definitely tell that there's something else going on. And if it's prolonged, so not just having a bad day, so that's different than just having like 
a day that's not going so well. It's prolonged. You're noticing that this is a behavior change that is severely impacting your life. It's impacting work. It's impacting your relationships with other people. It's impacting just everything that you're doing. Um, and so that's when you can tell that maybe there's that it's a time to seek help, to talk to someone outside of yourself. Definitely, definitely. And um, I think, well, any one of our panel of speakers can jump in on this question, but it's interesting that you said that you know, okay, it's, I need to seek help at this particular time. I don't know if it's the culture worldwide, but you know, we have a culture in Trinidad and Tobago. If someone, something is wrong mentally, damn crazy, damn crazy, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't know, um, Mrs. Wellington, Colleen, um, Shannon as well. And if any one of you all would like to answer this question, is a person really crazy if they need mental um, assistance in any way? Mrs. Wellington, you can go ahead. Yes, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not. Yes, you're hearing me, right? You're breaking up a bit. Yeah, very clearly. No, we're not hearing you very clearly. You hear me? No, no, you're breaking up a bit. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's hearing me. Uh, okay. Okay. So while you saw let that, me, while you saw let that, me out, say, are you hearing me now? Um, okay, maybe no. someone, maybe someone else. Maybe someone else can go while we yeah, while sure. I put my internet sure. something up. So Sh Shannon would or Kelly, anyone would you like that? Um, I can go ahead. Um, uh, the question I want to ask is if you are crazy by needing mental help. Absolutely not. I think sometimes we have this um horrible, like you say, stigma attached to getting help for your mental. But the same way I would go to the doctor even for a checkup of my body, um, is a practice we have to get with going for a checkup with your mind as well. So the same way that your, your body might need a little top up is the same way our minds need top up. So it doesn't mean that you are crazy. Um, we are three parts, spirit, body, soul, and that soul element, which is where your emotions, your mind is seated, needs to be taken care of just as much as every other part of yourself. So we really need to throw away the idea or the notion that we're crazy if it is that you need to get the help that is necessary, the same way that you would go to a doctor to get help physically. Um, so no, we are not crazy. As a matter of fact, more people need to go um, and seek out that help from people who are qualified to help us get our minds right. We live our mind, we live our life from our mind you know so why would you not want to make sure that that mind is in right order so you are absolutely not crazy if it is that you need to everybody needs to even if you think you you're in a good place you know so that's just my opinion so let me jump in here a bit shoddy so um why do i need a therapist and this question i can ask shannon why do i need a therapist if or if i have my girlfriends i mean come on we could chat about it i could tell my girl, girlfriend something isn't it basically the same thing. Um, I don't need to go to uh, a mental health practitioner or, or, and I have my girlfriends. What's the difference? What, what would you advise young women to do if they're struggling? Friends or actually go to someone who's qualified? Well, having friends can take the edge off because you know you need that safe space and people that you trust and so on. Your friends aren't qualified with the with the knowledge and the expertise of the, well, I don't want to say diagnose, but pinpointing the, the patterns and the root causes of what you behave that the way that you do. So to have friends is just to be like, okay, yeah, let me just get this out. But at the end of the day, just getting it out won't help you to move from the place that you are at. You want to be able to transition from the place of feeling unstable mentally to, to have somebody to give you strategies on how to move out of that place. Certainly. Awesome, certainly. One of, yeah, one of the things that, um, you know, well, this forum is for a lot of young persons. And, you know, we live in a, an age where we're tech, technologically driven. And a lot of TV shows 
um, they portray therapy as, you know, someone sitting on a couch with glasses or want to tell me your problems. So Mrs. Wellington, I know that you are a counseling psychologist. Could you just give us a, you know, a brief synopsis of what happens in a therapy session as opposed to just chatting with a friend? No problem. Are you hearing me? You'll hear me this time, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, I think, well, Miss Fraser was um, on point when she was talking about what's different between, you know, a therapist and a friend. In a therapy session, you know, similarly to what it's like with a close friend, it's a safe space. But I think um, there, your therapist is objective. A therapist doesn't have anything on the line, such as a friendship, you know, so that person is able to give you um, an unbiased, non-judgmental uh, response and approach and including strategies and analysis of understanding your own behavior and, you know, seeing your way forward. So in a therapy session, now this, this varies really according to the therapist, according to the approach that they take. Ultimately, um, there are some foundational aspects that, you know, go across the board where it has to be a safe environment. You have to feel comfortable talking to the person. You should not feel um, judged and even or maybe a little discomfort when you just start therapy when you come into that first session um, and you, you're not so sure how it's going to go and usually what happens is that your the therapist will walk you through what the process is going to look like because like I said it varies by approach so for example you know you look at things like confidentiality which is essential you know this helps create that safe environment knowing that what we're going to talk about is is confidential we talk about um, reasons for breaking confidentiality. If your life is at stake or if someone else is at stake and if the, the risk is very high, then we know that confidentiality may have to be broken. And then most therapists um, gather information through conversation and create um, an intervention plan that work, that where we work together towards your goals so the goals are established and how can we get there and then every session that follows stays with that intervention plan um always reflecting on your goals you know and how we are getting to where you need to go okay okay awesome and we're seeing in the chat where persons are agreeing with your comments so far the panel doing well people we, we're doing good we're in some safe hands this evening i feel so honored to have such qualified minds this evening. Um, one of the questions, Shadi, that really, you know, a young woman asked me is really, um, is, is I have, the person said, I've gone through, I haven't gone through anything like being abused. Could I still see a therapist or will I just be wasting her to her time? So is going to a therapist only because you've gone through some sort of trauma in your life also, and maybe we can ask Tanya, can, can you can you share a bit on that? Do we only need to go to a therapist if something really bad happened to us also? I would definitely say no. I think everyone needs a therapist, even therapists need a therapist. Okay. So I think we all go through things in life, whether it's a big trauma or a little trauma, it's a big thing that happens or a small thing. Um, but you can definitely talk to a professional that can help you to, um, to sort out some things that might be going on that's underlying that you might not even know that's there, um, but it shows up in different areas of your life. Um, it shows up again, like I said, in your relationships, it shows up, you know, at work. Um, and when I say relationships, it's not just like a, a romantic relationship, right? It's your relationship with your parents, your relationship with your friends, um, your relationship with your children, um, your relationship with your coworkers. Um, these different things happen in our lives that affect us. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a big trauma. It doesn't have to be that uh, we notice something that happened that really was really, really traumatic, whether it's something that we noticed or something that happened to us. But you can always go to a therapist and process things that that's there that might be affecting you that you don't necessarily know that's there. And that's, that's what therapists do. Like, you know, they definitely dig deep and uncover some of those things. Okay, awesome. Got it. Yes. Um... One second, please. Okay, 
as Nadia um, mentioned just now, you said that sometimes confidentiality has to be broken. Is that the case for a friend? So if I have a friend, let's say someone confides in me that they are suicidal, what can I do to still maintain? Now, I know it's different for therapists, but what can I do to help a friend who may be suicidal or is going through something extremely difficult without breaking that person's trust? Is that question directly for me, Shade? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, the tricky thing about this is that the unfortunate thing I should say is that at the end of the day, the king trust isn't the most important thing in that whole scenario. The most important thing is your friend's life done to be in. It really is a difficult position um, to have to break that trust. But it, it comes to that point when you you feel like you've done all that you can. You've taken these steps to try to support your friend. You've tried to guide your friend to a professional. Um, and your friend, you know, I believe that the average person can do somewhat of a risk assessment, right? Yes, as therapists, we are trained to do that more in depth, you know, more clinically. But if your friend has made a comment about ending their life, we never take that for granted. Um, we know help is something that should not be ignored. Um, and we direct them to, if they want, if you want to direct them to an anonymous hotline or somewhere that, you know, or a supportive person in their home, if they can find someone. Um, but I think it really comes down to making a really difficult choice when we realize that, you know, you've tried to walk your friend through this, you've tried to support your friend and they, they are adamant about not getting additional help. And they also, seem to really be struggling you really genuinely fear for your friend's safety and so it really comes down to making a difficult choice i've had to break confidentiality um at least a few times uh, especially with, well with teens um and it, it doesn't go over well to be honest sometimes they stop talking to you or they you know they have they are upset or they feel betrayed. But in all the situations that we have had to break confidentiality, in the longer term, it has benefited the individual, right? And usually they come back in a more positive space because want someone to know, even though they say they don't, right? So that's just, I know it's, it's a difficult place to be. Um, I, I would suggest consulting with someone who is in a you know a position of authority who can help guide you uh, as to whether or not you should you know break confidentiality by saying your friend's name you can talk to a professional as a friend you can give them a scenario and a professional can help advise you you know how to help your friend seek the necessary support all right awesome so with that in mind my question is and we want to shift a slight bit to school. Let's talk about school a bit and how does this whole education um, situation affect our lives? Um, what about, how does being a, a is, it, there's a, is there a difference between a perfectionist and an overachiever? That was one of our questions that came in, a perfectionist and overachiever. Shannon, maybe you can speak to that in relation to this individual is trying to perfect her grades, basically. And, you know, there were some struggles right there. And, you know, she really struggled with her education. Is there a difference between trying to be a perfectionist or an overachiever? Can you speak to that? Yes, please, sure. As an overachiever myself, I think what I lacked was the ability to understand that, okay, this is your best, Shannon. This, I had to make a a line, draw a line in the sand of this is how far I can go. Yes, I will be able to perform um, higher in certain instances, but this is my baseline. So let's say it's 70%. So anytime I get above 70, I will be like, okay, you did well, Shannon. But then we are so hard. I find um, the outside forces of our parents as well constantly. You have to do better. You have to do better. I know that you can do better. 
and they're constantly in our ears and this is and, and we're late but this is my best this is my best at this point this is my best i literally cannot give any more um so and then you have to consider all of the outside forces as well you you're trying to balance friends you're trying if you have a boyfriend at the time you're trying to balance that and if you're in a toxic environment in your home you're trying to balance that as well so all of these things are interfering with the ability with your ability to concentrate and to actually function and perform higher than that so i would honestly say that the perfectionist and the overachiever they clash somewhere in the middle because they have the same um, quote unquote, if I could call them attributes, you just push yourself to the limit and to understand too. And I think this goes back to, to understand understanding human nature. Nobody's perfect, but God. Awesome. So awesome. So the only perfect person is God. So you are really um, advising persons do your best, do the best that you can. That's that's awesome. We have a, a question in the chat. Um, and maybe Kelly could speak to this. My question is, if a person have trust issues, how do they even make the step to seek help from a professional? Some persons believe that once they seek professional help, that things are extremely bad, then they change their mind and suffer in silence. So how do we make that step to get to seek professional help? So the way I would answer that is, I think when the way that I would go about um, advising them to seek professional help is really acknowledging the point that you are located in your life. Um, so I could talk from my own life experience, um, especially with somebody in my background, you know, your brain will think, well, I can handle it. I have it under control. But then, then there's a level of honesty that you have to come to yourself when you realize I may have trust issues, but I am at the point where something needs to be done. And there is more water than flour or whatever the phrase is. So, so to the point where my trust right now isn't that important. Like they, there comes a point in time, young ladies, where you go through things where you realize, listen, is either I get help or I sink. And so in overcoming trust issues, in terms of getting help, you have to now switch the, you have to switch the way you, you see it. Yes, you may have trust issues in going to somebody for, for professional help, but how bad do you want to get better? So I understand the, the, the hesitation. Well, I don't really know this person. So you have to start seeing it. I have trust issues, but I don't know this person. So that's an advantage that I can have. So that was how I was able to even um, want to get professional help. Because again, I understand the trust issues, but then my brain did I don't know this person. So that maybe is something that might be an advantage for me. Um, another way I think in terms of getting over your trust issues to get professional help, do your research. Um, we have a lot of resources in terms of people who are available to us. So one of the things that help people who have trust issues is being knowledgeable. So when you, you get the information you need, so research therapists, research counselors, ask a friend, hey, Kill, you have a therapist by chance? So that like that's how I got my therapist. I I asked the friend, I was like, by chance, you have a therapist? Give me some more information about this person. Um, so with trust issues, do your research. Ask a friend, find out so you become more comfortable and then change your perspective. Stop seeing it as I can't trust this person because I don't know them versus this is an advantage. I don't know this person. This person doesn't know anything about me. Chances of our circles connecting are slim to none. So maybe this could be a very good thing that I don't know this person and they have no knowledge about me and that could help bring you at ease enough to even want to go and approach to get professional help. I think that's really um, a really good um, perspective and, and, and yeah. important. Um, just piggybacking off what you said, um, in terms of going for professional help, is it a one size fits all? Is it that, uh, Okay, I go to this person, I go to see, you know, Miss Tanya, and I'm like, okay, I'm feeling kind of uncomfortable, but I mean, she's qualified. Or I go to, you know, Mrs. Wellington, and I know she's qualified. Or is therapy more of a, you know, a, a personal connection where you must feel comfortable with the therapist? Tanya? Um, yeah. I think the yes, you definitely need to feel comfortable with your therapist. 
Um, no one wants to talk with someone that they don't feel comfortable with, right? So it's important to definitely feel comfortable because that, that relationship, that therapeutic relationship that you establish, that's what's going to drive the change. That's what's going to be like the base of making sure that that person is getting what they need out of the therapeutic relationship, out of therapy, and making sure that they're, they are actualizing some change in their lives. So yes, you definitely need to be comfortable with the person that you're speaking with. And if you don't feel comfortable, find another therapist. There are a lot of therapists out there. It's not just the one size fits all. Um, not every therapist is good for every client and not every client is good for every therapist. Awesome. Are they doing great, ladies? Come on, just put Hermine in the chat. Let's light up the chat again, Hermine, because I think we're having a fantastic session this evening. And Shadi, put a, a Hermine in the, in the chat for Shadi. Shadi is doing so great. She was very nervous about this. And I'm saying, okay, you'll be fine. You're doing so awesome. I am accustomed speaking to people. I need a rest. I want to get a rest. But she's doing <laughs> awesome. I want to pause for a minute from our question. I think, um, Nadeej, you have a question. Uh, uh, sorry. Come in, go ahead. You can. No, I just wanted to add to what was said. And sure. um, I was thinking of the whole concept of trust. Yes. And then um, Tanya was talking about the therapeutic relationship, which is what I was thinking about. And I just wanted to point out that you may feel like you don't trust people. Um, right. And the, the way the therapeutic relationship works is that when you come into that first session, you are not obligated to share your whole life in that session. Right. You know, right. it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gradual process where you develop that relationship that, as she mentioned, becomes a, a significant part of, of getting you to your goals and seeing the change that you want. And when you go through that process, you begin to build more and more trust as you open up more and more in a safe environment in a safe space so i just wanted to add that thank you good thank you so much um for that um adding to that and ladies on the panel you don't have to wait for us to call you if you want to add you know you can add value so we have a comment before i go to a question from our virtual audience um they're saying this is a great answer in regards to trust but unfortunately everyone isn't that strong to make a step that's why I believe people commit suicide and people close to them make statements like, I did not even know they had a problem. I believe identifying certain flaws in a person's behavior is important also. Like being too happy and everything is always perfect. And that's an awesome feedback. And we are going to get to the science. We're going to talk about that. We're asking questions as they come because persons are sending in questions as they come. So... Put a plug there, put a pin right there, put your finger right there. Let me jump to Miss Ann Davis, who is boiling with a question. <laughs> good Davis, evening. Good evening. Good evening to the to this very beautiful um panel and um very professional panel. Um actually. The, I don't actually have a question. I, I, I was asking you, Mrs. Placid, oh. if, if it is okay for me to ask some of the questions that were posed on the chat. Oh, because blame some it, of them were blame not. Blame it on the vintage <laughs> mind. We are not supposed to be in this space. No, listen, blame it on this. Let's, let's go. Thank you so much. So, yes, yes yeah, that's we'll have asking. a moment um, to pause. We have one more question from Shadi. Then we will pause to take a question from the audience. And then we'll jump right back into it. So, Shadi, go right ahead. So, challenge, I think, these, challenge these ladies. Yes, this is this is a big question. You know, we are on a panel with female. Um, this question asks, what is the link, or is there a link between menstrual cycle and mental health? Whether it is depression, Ooh. anything of this sort. You know, so I'll pose this question for anyone on the panel. And I'm listen, Shade, you know, when you ask that question, I saw all the faces, the eyes went from the eyes <laughs> exactly. open. Like, oh, what are you talking about here? Why are we bringing our period in the space? Yes. Our period don't belong in the space, but talk to us. Any one of you or each um, panelist, can you give us a, a very short, is our period linked to our mental health? Very quickly, we could have Shannon. Tell us, we all have our period, right? <laughs> and we all have mood swings sometimes, right? We go through things. So let's 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 talk about that. I would say um, because the 
the hormones in the brain actually are supposed to be um, stabilized. And then you have the hormones from your ovaries being released um, during your menstru menstrual cycle. It could have, you can have sometimes an override in the, in the chemicals and it causes you to have certain outbursts your um, extra irritable when your period is coming or when it's here. Um, ladies, we know, we know. The, the husbands sometimes complain or even our friends like, why well, you gonna behave like that? Not that we want to, but you know, sometimes the, the hormones are just being monsters sometimes. Um, so yes, it can, it can affect you mentally. And that is why I highly recommend exercise for the stabilization of not just the hormones for your brain, which um, cause the chemical imbalances that um, are the precursors to mental illness, but also to regulate the hormones that cause your period to come as well. Thank you. Somebody messaged me to ask, why did you bring period in this space? I mean, like, why? <laughs> it's like, we're going good all the time. Why are you talking about it? But let's go there. Kelly, talk to us. What is your take on, is, is, is there a connection? Is there a link between our menstrual cycle and this our whole mental state? Absolutely. Absolutely. So as somebody, of course, transparency on this platform, as somebody who has had issues in that department, um, in terms of that whole hormonal situation, um, Apart from our chemicals and hormones being imbalanced, which is a very real thing that a lot of young women don't realize. So this is just a plug, young women, get yourselves checked. Um, go and get checked. As somebody who lived a long life of not getting checked and then an emergency happening, go and check. Don't take for granted that your hormones are balanced and you're just moody and you're PMSing. Go and get checked. So that's just on the side. Um, but in addition to that, I think sometimes we take for granted how much we internalize when your body is in pain, especially if you're somebody who have very painful situations where your period is concerned, that messes with your mind. I think sometimes when I have my period and I'm having a rough time, um, you just sometimes feel betrayed by your body. You sometimes want to know about what in the world going on and it affects the emotions. It really does. Um, so <laughs> We, there is such a link with not just your period, but ovulating. A lot of women don't even understand that your body goes through a lot when you ovulate and you swing this way and you swing that way. Um, so it plays on your emotions, especially when you feel you can't control what is happening in your body. It plays with your mental health. So I think one of the most powerful things that I have realized with my body when I'm going through those stages is that awareness. So you see, if I have a moment where I start the ball on the place, I instantly ask and I check my calendar. Kelly, are you going through your session or your season right now where your period is coming? If that is the case, be kinder to yourself. Take your time. Allow yourself to feel whatever you need to feel, but then also understand that this does not control me but your periods are so linked to your mental health. Guys, ladies, so pay attention to it and go get help if necessary. I am telling you, if you hear my testimony, I promise you, go and get checked. Okay, awesome. And I'm sure a lot of them just relating right now. But Tanya, speak to us on that. Is our period linked to our mental health? What is your experience like? I definitely agree with everything that was said so far. I don't really have much to add there, but definitely uh, you can notice that there, I think everyone here can attest to that. Like you definitely notice that there are some mood changes um, that take place before your period, during your period. And that's about maybe two weeks. So you have two good weeks and two weeks that <laughs> not so good. So um, definitely, I think we all go through that to, to varying degrees. Some, some experiences are more severe than others. Um, and um, with more severe um, situations, you definitely need more than just mental health care, right? You need that, that physical, um, as Wellington, was just saying like, you definitely need need that as well. I, I don't think that was Ms. Wilmington, that was someone else. <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> Kelly, okay. <laughs> yeah, so definitely, you definitely need not just the mental health checkups, but you need your physical checkups as well, just to make sure that everything is working harmoniously together. Thank you. Last but not least, what's your experience, Hadith? What's your experience like? 
Mrs. Farzad. Okay, good. Mrs. Wallingan. So, I definitely like, you know, as was said, yeah, I definitely. Oh, boy. Are, we, are you hearing me? Yes. Hearing me now? Hmm? Oh, okay. I apologize. Okay, I'm having some technical difficulties this evening. Um, yeah, so I, I fully endorse all that was said. I, um, I also have had uh, experience that, that whole hormonal imbalance. I only learned in when I was in my later 20s, mid 20s or so or later, I only then learned about how to balance our hormones naturally, think to, you know, and how much they can affect us during our, our menstrual cycle. You know, we, I think a lot of young women take it for granted. And then sometimes our parents and grandparents just tell us, yeah, yeah, you know, I was just the same way. And we just think that this is exactly how it's supposed to be. When, when really, um, like Kelly said, we really need to look a little deeper and see what's going on with us. Um, what I would add is to, it's really important. I think someone mentioned in the chat that it can be triggering. So yes, you can, there is something called menstrual depression. So during your cycle, you can feel, experience those feelings of depression and they can trigger a whole long list of other things that you've been struggling with that now have become huge, right? Um, because of the, the hormones that are just flowing at that point. And I think it's so important, um, like Kelly mentioned, even for me, if I find myself, let me tell you all a funny story, right? I'll, I'll be quick with this funny story. My brother is, he lives abroad in Portugal, right? He's a professional athlete. He's very tall, he's six, seven, but I haven't seen him in a couple, a number of years, a couple of good, more than I would have liked because of COVID. And I went, I went to the gym the other day and I saw this really tall guy. He was, he, he looked like six, seven. And I immediately felt like crying. <laughs> I was like, I was like, Nadia, what's going on? Relax, relax. <laughs> And, um, and then I did the exact same thing that Kelly did not long after. Let me check my, let me check my little psych app here when, uh, you know, where I am in my menstrual cycle. I was like, oh, that's why I'm feeling to cry from seeing a random stranger because I miss my brother. And I just think it's so, it really is important to be able to identify for ourselves what's going on with us when we see things happen in our bodies to get that understanding of what's happening. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks um, for us to be able to have a good. Thank you so much. And just to wrap that question up, let's get period out of the space quickly before these <laughs> ladies send to. <laughs> You know, Shannon is a, a nurse. She said the painkillers can actually have a blood thinning effect and promote bleeding, so they may make your period heavy as well. So please check a doctor. And to wrap it up again, when you see Eve, you'll deal with Eve. Yeah, let's 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 blame it on Eve. It's it's Eve's fault. It's nobody else's fault but Eve. So don't be vexed. This this like every time this happens, just say Eve. I mean, you could have think. You know, right? So. Let's take a question from the audience. One person, could you raise your hand if you would like to ask a direct question before we go right back in? Anybody? Quickly, now don't let this opportunity pass you. Unmute your mic and feel free to ask a quick question. This audience real shy boy. Miss mm -mm. Davis. Okay, so now I do have a question. Uh -huh. um, I'm just waiting for everybody else to, to give everybody else a chance. But um, being part of the vintage crew, and I'm very proud of it, what I wanted, <laughs> what I wanted to find out, I remember growing up a lot of times the older, like my parents, and so they would um, make allusions to the changing of the moon when um, people, you know, suffer mental breakdowns and stuff like that. So <laughs> I really wanted to clarify whether it really has anything at all, any kind of connection to the moon or the, the phases of the moon or the changes of the moon, especially since 
um, one of the names um, that it's it's called, like lunacy, has some sort of um, connection to Luna, which has something to do with the moon. So I just wanted to get a little bit of clarity with that. Anybody in particular you want to ask? Um, any, I mean, there's a, a whole, you know, panel of professionals, so anybody could answer or everybody could, could answer. Who is it? Who, you know, who surfer? And if we don't know, we go, we'll have to Google it. <laughs> All right. Anybody want to take a try or? Okay. Silence, Ms. Davis. So I, I, I will direct you to Dr. Google or we will find somebody else to answer that very hard question. But good, good. It, it, it really has me thinking. Mm -hmm. um so it's something for us to really look into i i uh, think i'll talk to shadi she's the um google professional here good. so i'll yes, talk so. to her after this yes. <laughs> i'll talk yes, to her so. after i got my certificate so <laughs> good so uh, we have charlie Mirage who would like to ask a question and uh, wait i think yeah, go ahead. um nadia she wants to answer. Answer. So, I, I, I was just going to say i do not know about the move <laughs> specifically on the menstrual cycle um but i what it just brought to mind is that uh, we are actually affected our mood by our environment so yes. i wouldn't be fully surprised if there is something there but i think it's, it's also important to know that our um you know being in the out for example can lift your mood and yeah in rainy days sometimes some people feel down and there's this, this science to show that there is that connection between nature and moods i'm sure there may be something there but yes we'll go to the google professional so all right wonderful so let's go thank you um let's go directly to charlie's question hi good night everybody um i put it in the chat um i'm not sure because i am I think I'm a little part of the vintage too, but I remembered um, if there are still peer counselors at the schools, because what I found helpful, because when I was a teacher myself and family planning association had a peer counseling program where they trained young people. So there were always a few counselors in different schools. So when children had issues and problems, there was somebody their own age that they could have gone and spoken to and if it was too much for the counselor to bear, then it would have been passed higher up to maybe the, the school counselor itself. So I'm not sure if anybody could um, inform me if that is still in existence because it really did help at the point in time when children had issues. And because we had some amount of training, it was a bit better than going to a friend or somebody mentioning each other would have been biased, would have had their own point of view on the situation. So I don't know if anybody can answer. Um, I'm not quite sure if we do have that still. We, I know we have the guidance counselors departments in all schools where you can go to the guidance counselors, but peer counselors, I'm not quite sure um, in Trinidad if we still have those. If it is implemented, will be something privately directed by the school itself that they want to assist students. Maybe the student body population can be paired with other persons, but that's a fantastic um opportunity to help young people it's a fantastic idea so if we don't have it anymore i think it's something that we can push and to promote and as parents in the midst here we have some parents and even the the young women you can ask your class maybe to assign a peer counselor to find persons to strengthen that arm to help with persons coping and thriving skills within the student body yeah charlie I um Go ahead, Charlie. Will, um, just add to that, that, well, not add to it, but answer that some schools do have it. So my, um, not mine, but the secondary school that I attended, we had, um, there were peer counselors where, you know, the teachers will actually pick certain children they think are responsible and, you know, certain values, et cetera. And they would be trained for a period of time and they would have the, you know, badge and all of that. And, you know, they would be able to speak. You can speak to them. They'll just be walking on the school lunchtime anytime you can speak to them. And then the teachers always, um, the teacher in charge would always follow up with the peer counselors, you know, to get the feedback so that the children are, ju are not just holding information. So some schools do have it, others, I guess not. Thank you so much, Shari, for adding to that. So let's ask, move to Nadine with a question. Nadine? 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. What I would like to find out, um, is there a link between genetics and uh, mental health? You broke up a bit, but I'm thinking. Uh, one, uh, yeah, go ahead. I want to find out is has there been a link between genetics and mental illness? All right, Tanya, feel free, or anyone, Shannon, anyone. Yes, uh, nature, nurture. You know, like you definitely had. There's definitely a link between um, genes and mental illness. Um, you depth it's it can be I don't say hereditary but like if someone in your family has mental illness then chances are someone later on in the family line will develop a mental illness as well um, and it could be triggered by like a, a circumstance or a situation environmental factors as well so there are multiple factors, multiple things that can affect um, or um, bring about like those mental challenges in a person. And to add to what um, Tanya was saying, um, apart from the genetic predisposition, if we're gonna, we could take it a bit from the physical attribute and go to the spiritual side, we call it generational curses. Yeah, and those can be broken off in the name of Jesus. Yes. Yes. Shannon. Yes, I, amen. Can you go ahead? Can you go ahead? <laughs> yeah, Shannon, I was saying it. It was, it was, I was thinking about it because recently I was actually studying Deuteronomy, which was one of the, 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 um, the books that talk about generational cases. And mm -hmm. I heard somebody say something um, where they said, you can be predispositioned to a yes. genetic, a genetic situation, but you do have to accept it. Exactly. And for me, that was so powerful because it was saying, yes, you might be predisposed to anxiety because it was what your parents would have suffered, but because of, of salvation, because of now being a new creation in Christ, I don't have to accept that I am predispositioned um, right. to, to anxiety. So one of the things you'll hear people say a lot is that, well, I just like my mother and I just like my father. So you immediately invite the generational curse or the situation and you're like, versus saying it ends with me. Um, you know, so I think we have to be mindful. Yes, it could be genetic, but genetic means predisposed to it. It doesn't mean you have to accept it. And this is coming from somebody who my grandparents all died from mental health illness in terms of um, they all died from Alzheimer's, they all died from dementia, every last one of them. But then I remember hearing my father make this statement, it ends here today. And so he started to put things in place to make sure that even though he's predisposed to mental illness, he's saying, no, 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 my bloodline has changed. I am no longer a part of Vincent Scott's bloodline. I am now Dominic's got a new creation, so I don't have to be predisposed to that. And it's something even I talk to myself about because it will skip him, but it better skip me too. So we have yeah. to start declaring things like that. Like I am not going to accept something just because it's said to me. And too many times we do that, especially generationally. You know, much times people say you're just like your mother, and I say, hold on, <laughs> no, I am not. I love the parts of her that you know that would have fed me, but then I have to make a decision that says no. This ends with me. It is not going to pass on to my children because now I'm going to nurture them differently as well to ensure that whatever generation, it switches over to me. And I'm going to decide from this point on whatever legacy comes from me is going to be very different. So I agree completely with Shannon and Tanya with what they said. We might be predisposed, but I don't have to accept it. Thank you so much, Kellyn. And um, if you agree with all that we said, you have two things. You could say it ends with me, pull mine. But I, I want to ask a significant question. I'm putting on my pastor hat now. So take off everything else and I'm putting on my past. So can I just read the Bible or pray out my mental health situation, you know, and just forget about going to a therapist and the Lord is good and I am going to quote a scripture and get, get myself together. Can I just pray this thing out? How do we balance between our faith and actual our physical experience and going to a doctor? Mm. Deliverance. That's a question that gets me in trouble a lot. <laughs> I will be well, honest. You're in a good space to get in trouble this evening. 
because I am one of those young Christians who believe balance. I, I struck because I, I grew up in a background where all conversations have always been about deliverance in the way that we know it. So you better roll on the floor, you better vomit up the demon. <laughs> but one of the things that I have learned from studying the word of God is that in the word of God, God actually talks about therapy in different ways. It says, go and confess to your brother, go and be accountable to somebody, have a conversation with somebody. And so deliverance is very important because there's a spiritual aspect of it. but if you do not literally put plans in place to change your mindset you are going to be by the altar every single sunny sunday love rolling on that same floor because there's a part of deliverance that involves changing your mindset that's why god said be renewed um with the you be transformed by the renewing of your mind that is not a deliverance type thing that is it means that daily you have to get up and say to yourself how am I going to change my mindset? And sometimes that changing mindset means I might need to go to Tanya. I might need to go to Nadish because within myself, I don't know how, but Tanya might be able to teach me to renew my mind in a way that is necessary. So I am a young Christian who believes, yes, there's that element of praying about it. And again, we need to teach young people how to pray with power and purpose and see the Bible for what it is. And there's a whole other conversation. But then when you do that, the next step to it, which is your daily walking, is that now I renew my mind and that might mean I get help from somebody else to help me walk through that until I get it for myself so that's just my opinion I, I like your opinion so we have a lot of rolling and screaming to do but we want to encourage a balance so don't stop praying because we know there are spiritual things there that needs to go but in addition to that we need our support as well from our professionals that's very important. So you can seek advice from your spiritual leader, from your pastor, so and very well. You may have the whole of Trinidad and Tobago, the whole nation praying for you, but we also need to get you support. So don't just sit home, diagnose yourself, because we live in, a, a, in the Caribbean. It's very easy to whip up a bush tea to help your mind and to help your stomach and your everything. You need to drink some bush. You need something, you know, it's very easy for us to do that. So please, don't make the Santi and the Auntie and, and, and everybody and, you know, the people from in the winter section mix up a tea for you. Listen, get some professional help. Shadi, let's dive straight into some um, the questions yes. in regards to anxiety, depression. What are those signs? What, what I... can we see? I'm sleeping all day. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I just, I just don't want to see it. What's going on with me? Let's talk about those questions. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, first, let me just, I just want to add in to what Kelly said. I am 100%. There is this, um, what do you call it? I call her my social media role model. She actually says, prayer is a weapon and therapy is a strategy. And so I love that. Okay, so one of the questions that I will direct to Miss Tanya is, how do I, I will tie it into one. How do I know the difference between, oh, I think you answered that, but you could probably just touch on it again. How do I know the difference between depression versus a bad day? And apart from suicidal ideation, what are some signs to look for in a person who's struggling with their mental health? So just, you know, let's just um, touch on that again. So a bad day versus depression. A bad day, you might... Maybe you're driving down the road and someone cuts you off. Um, or maybe you went to school today and you got a bad grade and you just like in a bad mood. Um, you're just sad for the day. Um, but depression, it, it's deeper than that. It's not just sadness. Everyone gets sad, but depression is more pervasive. Um, maybe you're, you're sad for like two weeks in a row. Um, or for like a month and you're constantly cycling between like feeling okay and feeling depressed for a long period of time. Um, and that depression leads you to maybe isolate. Um, it leads you to um, maybe become like irritable, um, angry. Uh, maybe you're snapping at your parents and you're having a, an attitude or you're snapping at your friends or you don't wanna to talk to anyone. Um, and these are things that are completely different than your norm, right? You're not normally like this. And so there's a change in your behavior and that's when you recognize that there's a problem and 
you might not recognize it sometimes, but someone else outside of you, like a friend, a parent, um, a close person to you might recognize that these things are happening. Um, and so that's the difference between like that depression and that sadness. What was the other question? <laughs> um, well, I think you, you answered it. Okay. Basically, what, are the signs, what are the signs to look for? Um, okay. But as you, you said, you know, speaking to a professional, one of the, the questions um, my friend asked me recently was how do I get comfortable opening up to a therapist when I usually internalize things? Hmm. Oh, what? That's, what a, that's a very, that's a very good one. It kind of goes back to um, that relationship building, kind of recognizing, I think someone else said this, this is someone that you don't know, right? Like um, sometimes you internalize things because maybe you're afraid of judgment from the people around you. Um, maybe you, um, maybe you're just a private person and don't like people knowing your business. But going to a therapist, this is someone that doesn't know you and maybe you can find comfort in that knowing that it's a safe space and that whatever you share in that space is confidential and that nothing that you share is going to be shared with anyone else outside of that room unless you tell them that you wanna hurt yourself or hurt someone else or that someone, if you're underage, if someone else is hurting you, right? Um, unless you're in danger or you are putting someone else in danger. That's the only time that confidentiality is going to be broken. Um, so just being, being reminded of that or just knowing that going in, that might be helpful in helping you to be more open. Wow, wow, wow. I am loving this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. Um, I'm going to direct this question for Mrs. Wellington. One, when you have, when you're dealing with a minor, will this person ask, will my therapist tell my parents or other persons that I am seeing them? Trinidad and Tobago is a small place. So Shadi, before Mrs. Wellington answered her question, what you're really mm -hmm. trying to say is if my files will be bust. That is in the local exactly. parlance. You understand? If they're going basically, to bust my files. Basically, but I cannot okay. this on the streets or in the church. <laughs> Mrs. Wellington, go right ahead. Uh, so um, if you're under the age of 18 in Trinidad and Tobago, um, parental consent is required for you to proceed with therapy, right? That's, that is important, that is important. But even if your um, parent or guardian is aware or is a part of that process in terms of you coming to see a therapist, what happens or what we talk about in, in therapy is still confidential, right? There is some consultation that happens with a parent because parents play a huge role in what happens in your home or in terms of helping you uh, face whatever your challenges are. You know, sometimes parents need support, sometimes parents need guidance, sometimes parents themselves need to make adjustments in order to help create a better environment for you. So those are some things that would come up in conversation with a parent, but it would not be what was discussed in therapy. I hope I'm not, I hope I'm being clear. So we talk about, let's say we talk about, okay, you tell me you're, you cry, you're crying a lot and you're feeling, you know, and we were thinking about if this is depression and we're looking at how often you cry. I will, I may go to your parents and say, what are some things that you all can do together? You know, is there anything that you all do that is fun activities, family activities? I'm not going to go to your parents and say, so she said she's crying a whole lot. No, because that was said in session and that is confidential, right? But, the, but it, it is important that parents, when you're under the age of 18, it's really important that parents are included in the process to help you because ultimately we are all working together to help you. Certainly, certainly. And, you know, I think of it as, um, as, as looking for a babysitter almost. You know, trying to find a good, I mean, okay, it's probably totally unrelated, but trying to find a good caregiver for your child, right? Because this is caring for his or her mental health, which is, you know, ultimately extremely important. So for parents or for persons on here who may be looking for a therapist, what are some things to look out for? What are, what are some, some, you know, characteristics or signs that a person can look it out for when searching for a therapist? Mrs. Wellington, sorry. <laughs> um, 
So like was mentioned earlier, you know, doing your research is very important. So you need to know that this person is qualified, first of all. Um, and also it's important to note, you know, we talked a bit earlier about if every therapist is for every person. So some persons have, some therapists have, are specialized in certain areas. So it's important to know that if you are going to that therapist or your child is going, that they are able to help you or your child with the specific issue that you're facing, right? And they're not an expert in something completely different. So that is important. Um, you know, as was talked about, it has to be somebody that you are comfortable with or that your, you know, your child is comfortable with. Um, because, you know, you might take your child and this to a, um, class and you don't like how the teacher is speaking to your child but that teacher may be very qualified and very experienced but it's not what you might be looking for your child isn't comfortable because of that sort of interaction so it's, it's similar um, you have to be comfortable make and sure that the person is qualified and, and I think it was mentioned before in terms of asking around you know doing doing your, your due diligence yeah I think thank you so much be, yeah Thank you so much. You all are doing so great. So Shadi, I'm wondering, um, let's talk a bit about something that while I am working with young women that I found that is very um, prevalent, limiting beliefs, and they go into a state of depression, they go into a state, they have anxiety attacks because of their mindset. Um, Kaleem, could you speak, what are those limiting beliefs? Well, how does it affect our life? And then maybe Shannon could pick up from where Colleen, um, will speak on. Not a problem. So limiting beliefs really are those negative thoughts and opinions that you hold about yourself or your life that you hold as very absolute. So you believe with all your heart that this negative thing really is what you live by. Um, and the issue with limiting beliefs, when you hold these negative thoughts and you hold these negative opinions, beliefs, the problem with this is that it stops you from moving forward and living the best life that you have to offer. Um, so limiting beliefs, especially in young women, could be so devastating because what limiting belief, beliefs do as well is they blind you to the reality of who you really are. Um, because what I, I have of the firm believe that limiting beliefs are lies. Yes, there might be areas that you can build on and become better and as the beauty of progressing and getting older. But for the most part, a lot of these negative thoughts are lies and they are not truths about you. And a lot of it is grounded in faith. Um, so you see a lot of young women have these limiting beliefs. And because of that, they don't make some bold moves or make some quiet, sweet steps that they need to make. And that would really carry them forward in life. So I would say that and allow Shannon to run with it from there. In addition to what Kelly had so beautifully said, I do agree as somebody who have who has been battling with limiting beliefs myself, I want to say sometimes they don't actually come from us. If you just like Kelly mentioned earlier, you constantly hear people telling you stuff about yourself, you just let your mother, you will never amount to anything. And I want to speak to parents about this as well. Be careful of the things that you say over your children. Be very careful of the words that you speak over these kids. Because as the child goes through life, the first voice a child will ever hear is yours. And as long as it is registered in here, my mother said I would never be anything. Or my dad said that I am just like my mom. I constantly move off of that. And then it is so hard to break out of that shell. And I remember I'm going to share an experience that I had, I left my secondary school with just three CXCs and that's what sent me into depression. I talked about it in the book. I was suicidal and all of that. And I, the fear of trying to do any exam again crippled me. I believed that I could not be a doctor from this place. And that held me bound for so many years until God burst through and he's like, this is who I called you to be. It doesn't matter that you don't believe it, but it is what I said. And to get me out of that place, he, as Kelly said, again, he, he asked me to renew my mind. Shannon, you need to get up and get from this place. If you want to see different results, you have to do different things. You have to do things differently. And this is where I started to 
affirm myself. And one of the most powerful things we can ever say is I am. That's why you have to be so careful of what you put after that I am. Because God, that's what God said he is, I am. When Moses asked him, who should I say sent me? He said, I am. He didn't see anything else. We could add whatever we want to put there. It's up to us. But I pray that if these young, you young women take anything from this, is that you need to start speaking positively over yourselves. You have to. Nobody's going to do it for you. If you sit back and wait on people to come and speak positively over you, I am here to tell you that you're going to be wasting your time because most people don't have anything good to say. And those negative beliefs, those limiting beliefs actually, you know, limit you. And the goal is to just see yourself the way God sees you. That's it. What anybody else thinks doesn't matter. Thank you so much. And it's rightly so that the way you think affects the way you feel and the way you feel affects the way you behave. So we need to know what we put into our thoughts. And, it, and the Bible rightly said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we need to reset our mindset. We really, really need to press reset and get this thing over and self-talk. You know, I was sharing with somebody, it's like, you talk to yourself. I speak to myself all the time. I look at myself. I give myself some credit. I look at, and because there are days we definitely don't even want to look at ourselves in the mirror. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. There are days where you face something, break out on your face or somewhere hanging, hanging down like you didn't want it to, something not fitting right. And especially if you step out of the house and somebody tell you something, I mean, come on, you just want to die. And then to the age group between the 12 to let's say around 15 or so this invisible audience that they feel somebody is always looking at me nobody watching you but somebody watching me because so there are so many things that we go through and so many things that young people will go through but i want to ask um each one of the panelists just if somebody what can i say to someone who is suicidal to help them see that life is worth living. One thing, you have one opportunity to speak to a young person, each one of the panelists, what will you say to that person to give them hope? Let's go with Tanya, please. I'm assuming that this is someone that I have a relationship with. Yes, yeah, someone so you have a relationship with. One of the, the, the what I would ask, and I'm, I'm kind of careful to say this, but I, I really think it's, it's a powerful thing to do if you really have a relationship established with the person. I would ask, why haven't you done it? And I know it sounds like, I know it sounds I like, what, I what kind of question is that? But I really think that that question really helps that person to think about the reasons why they need to live. Yeah. Like, why haven't wow. you done it? Yeah. Well, I haven't done it because I don't want to hurt my mom. If I do it, then I'm going to leave my siblings behind, right? So it's kind of giving them that opportunity to seek for things or reasons why they are still here. And then you can build upon that um, by helping them to realize that these are reasons that you need to that you need to live. You still have a purpose. You have something that God has put you here on earth for to accomplish. And you have not accomplished that yet. It's not mm -hmm. our lives is not ours to take. Right. God gives us our lives. And when he's ready, he will allow us to expire that life. And we know that there is a, a new life after this life. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's important to recognize that we all have a purpose and it has not been done because there is something or someone that that um, our lives is impacting in a positive way. Um, and if we do take our lives, then that purpose or that impact that we need to have on that person is it's it's not happening Beautiful. thank Beautiful. you so much and before you answer one of the reasons i asked that question the reality is our young women will not go to a therapist just like that they will right. talk to a friend mm -hmm. and you know you may have this consultation and they may share i just don't feel like living anymore so mrs wellington you and the good bestie what would you say to that individual that will give them hope thank you tanya well, I mean, I was going to say that um, I would just say what Tanya said. <laughs> she said it so perfectly. 
um, I definitely would start in the same place, if not exactly asking, why haven't you done it? But identifying some reasons to live. I feel like it's so important to get the individual to see that and start exploring that for themselves before starting to tell them. Because to reach that point where you've been, where you're thinking about ending your life, you would have more than likely gone through a process where your friend was giving you advice. No, girl, you know, we love you. We care for you. Your family loves you. You've been saying these things. These things are more than likely have been said. So I believe that just giving advice alone in, in that moment isn't the only thing, but incorporating that person and helping them to see for themselves. So what, what are some of your reasons to live? Even if they can come up with one reason and they have five reasons not to, right? That one reason is what you have to help them to focus on, you know, and, and kind of dig deeper in, into that. That's, yeah, that's the only thing I could add because I think it's, it's, it's a, a good approach awesome. that was awesome. shared before. Thank you so much. Kaleen, what would you say to your friend who's telling you midnight, 12 o'clock, 12 midnight, I just want to take my life? Yeah. So, no, my, my, my history with suicide is very interesting because I have a friend who succeeded in killing herself. Um, when I was in high school and then a very dear friend of mine who's the godmother of my godchildren, the, the mother of my godchildren now, um, has been in that situation where I got to her in the nick of time. And one of the things that helped in terms of when I asked her to give me some kind of strategy, one of the questions I was able to ask my friend in that moment was, if you can imagine just one thing that you want for yourself, five years from now, it could be how crazy, it could be how far, it could be how out there it is, what would that be? I remember she gave me the answer and I said, okay, so how are we both now going to work towards you getting that? Because right now you can't seem to have a reason to live, but the fact that your life means there's a future of possibilities out there for you. So, cause she really, in that moment, cause this is somebody who lost both her parents in the space of two years, um, she had nowhere to live, that kind of stuff. So I knew if I asked her that, she would have said, Kelly, I have no reason in this moment to live because I understood. So I asked her instead, if five years from now, you had the opportunity to do absolutely anything. Um, and that was the question that changed both, I have to say changed both of our lives. Um, because from that point on, I remember we sat down the night and she wrote down, Five years from now, I wanted to be a teacher. Five years from now, I wanted to have two children and that kind of stuff, but it doesn't feel attainable. I said, I didn't ask you whether it was attainable or not. This is where we are at. But it gave us something to look forward to. And so now when I deal with friends, because sadly, I still deal with a lot of friends who struggle with suicide, that tends to be, as long as God leads me to ask that question, that's the angle I tend to take it from. If you had the chance to kind of shape your future five years from now, two years from now, a year from now, whatever your wildest dream is, what could that look like? And how can we now create a plan to get you to that point? Thank you so much. And Shannon, I know you have had personal experience with the area of you know, suicide ideation or even trying it yourself. Talk to us about your experience of it. And what did you see or what helped you? I want to share that and then I want to share my experiences at my job. So I will close off with the, with the experiences at my job. But yes, I was 16 years old at the time, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I had just finished high school or what we call secondary school here in Barbados, 16. Very, very excited and it's doing everything. I, I just want to become this doctor. And I remember I was, have, I was in a relationship with an older man at the time and I found out that he had cheated on me and I got the X result the day after that or two days after so I really felt like there was nothing to live for in my 16 year old mind it was like I I I I, I had a cruise plan we were supposed to have a whole life together and babies and and everything and and not, it, it wasn't just the fact that he cheated, but it was for other women. So I felt really worthless and hopeless. And I just 
stopped eating gradually. I lost a lot of weight. I wasn't talking to anybody. I would just wake up to cry. And then the, the thoughts would come um, constantly. You're a disappointment to your family. You should just kill yourself. And I'm a very strong-willed and strong-minded person, but I continue to tell people whenever I share my story that it doesn't matter how strong you are or you think you are, constantly hearing something has the ability to break you. And that's exactly what happened to me. So I believed the lies of the enemy and that's when I started to cut my wrist. And it wasn't that I wanted to die, that was it. It wasn't that I wanted to die, I wanted the emotional pain to stop and I wanted that release. And I got it when I cut and I continued to cut um, for a good couple of weeks. And I remember I had a little cousin because I love children. And she would come in my bedroom every time I cut my wrist and she would dry the tears from my eyes and she would wipe the blood from my wrist. And she would give me a hug and just go back out every single time. And it was so crazy to me. And then one day, I was about to, to cut as usual and I sat by my bedroom and I remember the sun was coming in on me and everything and this, I didn't hear the voice of God, it was like an impression. And he was saying, Shannon, you've been down long enough. It's time to get up. And I remember I was so weak because of all the weight that I had lost and I literally had to put one foot in front of the other to try to get up off the ground. And I got up and I'm like, okay, so where do we go from here? And I, I didn't know, I didn't know what my next step would have been. And the following week, I got a call from one of our tertiary institutions here asking me if I'm still interested in doing their nursing auxiliary course. And that is just my story. Everybody may not have that encounter directly with God. I believe, I always tell people that I believe God wanted all of his glory because there was never hospitalized, nothing of the sort, nothing, nothing, nothing. I just got up from that suicidal place and never looked back. So currently I work at our psychiatric hospital here in Barbados and during the pandemic, I realized that we have been having a huge influx of suicidal patients, especially men especially men. And I try my best not to get emotional. Sometimes I do, but I try not to let them see me in that light. And I ask them, I usually ask them, why? What, what happened? And I, I open that, that space for them to communicate. Some of them actually do, or they just stare blankly at me. And I would be like, okay, well, if you don't want to talk, no, I could probably like come back later, but usually when they do speak, I am then able to say, you matter. Your existence matters. You know, I, I know it may not feel like that right now. I know, yes, because usually it it is bills and um, job loss and relationship issues, family issues, all of that stuff. And it seems like there's no way out but I am talking to you as somebody that was exactly where you are. And I believe that that helps um, them too in terms of having somebody to relate to. So I try to be as gentle as possible and I usually leave them with, take it one day at a time. You don't have to have it all figured out right now. One day at a time. We can take this one day at a time. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Shannon. And I have moved, you know, beyond the one day at a time. One young woman said to me, a day is too long. One moment at a time, sometimes. Just take the breath. So I embrace that now. For those who can go to the entire day, could it to you? But there are some people, we just need one moment at a time. And so significant what all of you would have shared. The questions. Please, if you're in this space here and you're struggling with, with suicide ideation, message privately and we will have a conversation. But we want to encourage you that you matter. We want to encourage you. Make a list of things. Why not? 
why why you didn't do it you know um so and there is so much to live forward to so i want to hand over to the very capable study and we're about to really wrap up our session if you have questions drop them in the chat quickly or right after shadi we'll take at least two and we will wrap up all right wow 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 so mrs flasser do realize and that we are certainly certainly without a doubt going to need a part two oh okay <laughs> like if, if you want a part two i'm just asking for you all to put some type of reaction put the thumbs up reaction on the chat because this is wow this is amazing daddy i think i will go way beyond that in the coming in the new year we are going as prices we are going to have a support group for young women and it is going to take yes, the state definitely. of dealing with your mental health where we can come and have conversation but if you want this to happen just put her mind in the chat let's have it going and who knows some of our ladies here may very well join us ever so often because we are in this thing together we are responsible to change lives that's why we are here so if you would really want the support group to happen let's impact the trinidad and tobago and the caribbean with our space drop her mind in the chat so shadi i think you had one or two final questions for Okay. Yes, I'm gonna read the question. Someone posted a question in the chat earlier. Okay, so someone asked, a lot of people in the Caribbean have grown up in a culture of what goes on in this house stays in this house. Do you think this is, sorry, do you think this is contributing to a lot of young women or men because men struggle as well right do you think this is contributing to a lot of a lot of young women from reaching out for help so i'm going to ask this question i'm going to tie it in to also um to also the question that would ask how do you honor your parents without being um just let me read that one How do you honor parents that have hurt you? So we're gonna tie it in. And I will ask, I will ask everyone to just give an input in different ways. Can we ways. question in two parts so that they can be sure. or just... Yeah, I know I broke it up. Okay, a lot of people in the Caribbean have grown up in a culture of what goes on in this house stays in this house. Do you think this is contributing to a lot of young women from reaching out for help? And also, how do you honor, you know, the Bible says, honor your father and mother. How do you honor parents who fit you? So I- You're muted, baby. Sorry, I said, I'm just gonna throw that question out for Shannon, as well as Kelly. Remind me of the first question again, please. Sure. The Caribbean phrase that says what goes on in this house stays in this house. Do you think that is contributing to a lot of um, persons staying silent? Yes. While suffering in silence? Yes, I truly do. Um, there's an element of fear linked to that. And I know, like, especially if you and your parents don't have a good relationship or they just did discipline as a means of fear you would be afraid to speak out um, against anything that they do but I want to encourage anyone who lives in a household like that please 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 say something please um don't don't be don't think about what could happen when your parents find out um, what you have said, think about the, the better life that you can have as a result of someone else knowing what is going on with you. Because the longer you stay there, the more you're going to repeat those experiences and the cycle continues. If somebody knows, then something can be done about it. And to the next question, I smiled because God sent you for me. That's the truth. <laughs> that's all I could say you didn't you didn't choose me by chance 
I had an experience with my dad um, when I graduated nursing school. I, he did not attend my graduation. And this broke me. Um, I actually stopped speaking to him. I didn't have anything to say. I was severely disappointed. And according to my therapist, I have this cancel culture mindset. So as long as you hurt me, I'm done. I am done. I don't care who you are. You could be the poor. I am finished. And, <laughs> and this is something that we are currently going through. And my therapist would have said to me, you know, Shannon, that same scripture, honor your father and your mother. You may not have liked what your dad did. Yes, he did disappoint you. And that wasn't the first time that he disappointed you. However, you are called to honor him regardless. So it's not a case where, you know, I had to, to accept or I'm still in the process of accepting that maybe the relationship that I want with my dad might never happen. And it's very challenging, to be honest, because I am a daddy's girl. And so I am, I am working through that in terms of honoring him. So I give him the respect that he is due. And honoring too, and I want to leave this here, honoring doesn't necessarily mean that you have to obey. Because sometimes your parents don't be telling you to do anything godly. Not saying that that's what my father did, but... Honor and obedience are two totally different things. You obey, obey God, yeah? Regardless of, you be respectful to your parents, you obey God and you honor them just as the Bible says. But apart from that, just by, try to be as respectful as possible, to be honest. Ellie? Thank you so much. So the first part would have been if the, the, that Caribbean context, and I'm sure it's not just the Caribbean context in terms of being silent because you don't want anybody to know your business, essentially. Um, <laughs> of course, we would have grown up with that mindset. And I think a lot of us don't even know how that has manifested itself. So the amount of times I would have grown up here and you are too emotional um, and what you need to talk about at four because there's this notion that some of the trauma that happens to us shouldn't be as traumatic as they were so what it tends to do to us is that we become a bit numb <laughs> to some of the trauma that we experience because we've been taught to be silent for such a a long time um that it, it lessens that i i think though our generation is changing that in terms of realizing no it's okay for me to say something um i think the reason why well, one of the things that helped me understand that is that our parents would have grown up in a generation that would have taught them that as well um, and so it helps me to be a lot more forgiving of when my parents would have said, why are you being so emotional? Because it would have meant that somebody would have said the same to them um, that would have taught them to not um, validate their emotions and then to work through it um, in terms of that. In terms of honoring your parents, I want to give some practical ways to do that because I had to live a very the practical side of, of that. Uh, my mother and I are very similar but because we are similar, it meant we went at each other a lot. Um, I am now at a stage where I live in my own house. I cleared my own keys. However, while I lived with her, um, a lot of hurt would have happened. One of the things that God was able to help me in honoring my mother was to allow me to understand that my mother was raising me as she was discovering herself. So that was one of the key things that helped release me from any hurt or anger where she was concerned. This was a woman who did not have the same resources that I have now, um, where now I could go to a therapist and have a conversation. I could get those resources. She didn't grow up like that. So I had to now become very empathetic to the fact that my mother was raising me the same time that she was trying to figure out a lot. So that made me understand sometimes some of these things that she would have said, some of the things that she did. Now, one of the things 
if it is that you want to honor your parents to the point of reconciliation, because there's a difference where I honor you, but I stay from a distance. In terms of reconciliation, there's a level of needing to address the hurt that is necessary. There's a difference from addressing it and throwing it in your face. That's two different conversations. Um, throwing it in your face just means conflict is going to happen. One of the ways I had to learn to honor my mother and respect her, because I don't want to embarrass my mother, was anytime something happened where hurt transpired, I would write her a letter. It sounds funny, but I knew if I had to articulate myself to her, all hell was going to break loose. We were going to end up fighting. Something was going to happen. So what I would do, I would say to her, like, listen, mommy, right now, I cannot say to you what I want to say. So give me some time. And I will sit down and write her because writing a letter would have given me um, the opportunity to really kind of pinpoint exactly what I was feeling. And so when I write a letter, then I would literally give it to her. Now, there have been times I've written letters to my mother and she didn't talk to me for three, four days because of what would have been in the letter. But what it did, it, it facilitated healthy conversation with us because she knew exactly what I was thinking, what about it hurt. And because I was able to articulate myself like that, she was more open to it. Now, of course, everybody's parent isn't going to be like that. I just knew that that was the method that worked for her for both of us so one of the ways you can honor your parents is ask yourself what no you have to live to be aware outside of your own hood you have to start observing your parents what are some things that make my parents tick writing a letter to my father will be a waste of time he's not going to read it it's not going to yield anything but carrying him for ice cream might soften him up enough to have a conversation so observe your parents Make sure you know exactly what you're feeling, your pain points, so that you don't just vomit it on them <laughs> and find a way that works best for you and how you can articulate that. So honor your parents by one understanding that they're not just your parents. They, they will Bob, they will Suzanne before they became mommy or daddy. And that gives you a level of grace to deal with them and then to find some kind of tactic that gives them the respect because not once did I shout or scream at my mother. Gives them the respect, but gives you the opportunity to articulate, articulate yourself in a safe space. And then the last thing I would say is sometimes with parents and honoring them, you have to create boundaries. As I got older, you hear what I say, as I got older and I know that I wasn't at risk of being slapped down, <laughs> um, there were some boundaries that I put in place. So there were some things that my, my parents wouldn't allow to say to me anymore because I would say to them, listen, I understand this is your opinion, this is your view, but now that I stand on this side as an adult, I'm letting you know that I'm no longer accepting this. Were there times where I had to run for cover? Perhaps. But over time, as they got into the habit of understanding, Kelly is now an adult. I am 29. There's, there's a different type of parenting that has to come from them. Once I drew that boundaries, they began to respect it over some years. Um, so know the type of respectful boundaries that you have to put in place in order to honor them. Because those boundaries keep me from sinning against my parents. Because if I don't, I'll respond in a way that God is going to be like, Kelly, you really said that for your mother? You really did. Um, so boundaries, healthy way to express yourself and then understanding that your parents are humans. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Y'all, we certainly need a part two. It is five to seven and the questions are still flowing. So I'm going to just ask too, many, too much, too much, more questions and then we're going to wrap up for today all right so, so i'm going to ask these last two questions will be directed to our two psychologists mrs wellington and mrs asbury so um i'm going to ask for both of you all to answer the both questions if if it makes sense yeah all right so the first question is what is resilience and does resiliency or being strong mean, just like, I can't understand. What is resilience? And if a person is depressed, does it mean that they are not resilient, resilient or they are not strong? So I'll ask Miss, Mrs. Asbury to answer first and then um, Mrs. Wellington. Resilience is the ability to kind of go through difficult situations and pick up the pieces and move forward. It's the ability to not stay stuck 
but to take the experiences of that situation and continue to move forward and to continue to push forward. Um, how do, what was the second question? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's a good um, The question is, if a person is depressed, anxious, or having suicidal thoughts, does it mean that they are not resilient or that they are not strong? Not at all. I think definitely you can be resilient. It doesn't necessarily, being resilient doesn't mean that you don't hurt. It doesn't mean that you don't experience life. It doesn't mean that you don't experience depression or anxiety or any other um, form of uh, mental challenges, right? Um, it just means that as you're going through these, you're able to use tools to be able to help you to get through and to continue to move forward. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're, that you're not strong. It doesn't mean, and being depressed does not mean that you're not strong either because some of the strongest people experience depression. So that has nothing to do with the other, but um, it just, being resilient means that you're able to pick up the pieces of your life, no matter how difficult they are, um, the ch experiences, the challenges that you experience and being able to put them back together, um, even if the pieces doesn't quite fit right? It, like a puzzle. Maybe it doesn't fit into a hole, but you're able to pick up the pieces that you have and continue to move forward. Wow. wow, wow. Thank you so much, Mrs. Wellington. I would add, um, because I mean, her answer was quite comprehensive. <laughs> I would just add that um, one question uh, that I asked that sometimes therapists use as an approach in therapy is asking, um, in spite of all that you've been through, how are you still here now? How are you still at, how are you here? How are you at this point in spite of everything that you've endured? And I think that definitely speaks to what um, Tanya was saying about, it doesn't show a lack of strength because you are here. One, you're seeking, you're seeking help, um, which in itself is a, is a demonstration of strength, you know? Um, and even if you haven't taken that step to, to seek help, to seek support, you are still here in spite of, right? Meaning the situation, it could have been significantly worse. And the reason you are still here is because of the resilience that you do have and the strength that you have been leaning on. Perhaps the strategies haven't been working for you. Perhaps it hasn't felt like enough. Um, perhaps you haven't been feeling the joy and the peace that you want to. But it doesn't mean that you're, you're not resilient. It doesn't mean that you're not strong. It just means you need some guidance. You may need some support in terms of pulling those strengths out, identifying those strengths that you, you would have demonstrated, but you may not have been able to see them for yourself. And, um, and it, it goes back to, to things like limiting beliefs. You know, you might, you might um, your limiting might, beliefs might be keeping you from seeing your strengths, seeing the resilience that is actually present. So I would just, yeah, that's, that's what I would add to that. Um, don't don't um, undersell, if, if I could use that word, how resilient you are, how strong you are. You know, uh, uh, and, and like I said, seeking help and reaching out for support is a sign of strength as compared to weakness, like most people tend to see it as, not most, but some. That's what I would add, Shadi. Thank you so much. All right, so we have... Okay, I'm gonna ask this question. Someone asked in the chat. Okay, they asked anonymously. Um, so I'm gonna just ask um, the answer to be flipped. So Mrs. Wellington will answer first and then I'm gonna ask Mrs. Asbury to just wrap up, please. Can you negotiate with your parents as an adult if he or she asks you to do something that you cannot do at the moment or should you be obedient and just do what he or she says? Uh, I'm laughing because I feel like that's such a common challenge that, you know, it's, it's, it's so much more than just doing the thing, you know, as a teenager, you're striving for a sense of identity and independence. And so it's, you often don't necessarily want to do things when your parents ask you to do it. Um, and it, I think sometimes it's difficult for parents to come to terms with the fact that, okay, my child has a mind of their own and they're growing up and they also need to learn to manage their own time, right? Um, so I'm trying to remember the exact question so I don't go off track. <laughs> I think, are you saying the question? Asked, yeah, repeat the question to me. Okay. They said, can you negotiate with your parents? Right. As an adult. So as an adult, can you negotiate 
if basically asking if you just have to yield to the request of your parents as an adult, as or an can adult. You yes. Okay, yes. so you are you are an adult and your parents are saying you need to do something. Yes. Okay. You can <laughs> I feel like I feel like Kelly would have such an animated response to this question, but you can absolutely negotiate with your parents as an adult. As a teen, it, it, it would be wonderful if you also can do that, if your parents help facilitate that environment. But for sure, as an adult, you know, it, 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 boundaries, like she mentioned, is so essential. You know, uh, effective communication. You can still be respectful as an adult to your parents and, and, and negotiate doing something that they've asked you to do. And in some cases, even refusing to do certain things they've asked you to do sake of your mental health for, for so many reasons you know that 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 is your right as an adult to be able to have that conversation set those boundaries and say very clearly okay I hear what you're saying you can be respectful but this is what I think this is how I feel and you know hopefully be able to come to some to some middle ground definitely yeah I don't I don't believe that just doing everything your parents say when to do it is necessarily what it means to respect your parents as an adult, right? Yeah. So that's thank you, thank you, thank you. And while I feel like your answer was so comprehensive, I'm just going to give <laughs> just ask for your chance to just answer this last question. If we have someone on the platform right now that is struggling with anxiety, is there anything that that person can do in this moment to calm themselves? Most definitely. Um, you can take some deep breaths, um, ground yourself, do some um, grounding. Um, one of the exercises that might be helpful is um, using your senses to ground you, um, identifying five things that you can see in the room, um, four things that you can touch or feel, three things that you can hear, two things that you can, um, that you can smell, and one thing that you can taste. Right, so just incorporating your senses and being present, physically present in the moment and just trying to ground yourself. Um, again, um, deep breaths, not just deep breaths as in like fast deep breaths, just, just really, um, really um, controlled deep breaths. Uh, taking a deep breath maybe for four seconds, inhaling for four seconds, holding that breath for four seconds and exhaling for six seconds and then repeating that um, over and over for at least two minutes. Those things might help you to kind of gain control and to just be in the moment and decrease that level of anxiety. And could you just repeat that quickly? I just want to type it in the chat. Five things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> five things five, you can five. see. Five things mm -hmm. you can see, four things you can touch or feel. Um, so those mm -hmm. things could be physical things that you can touch, like a paper, pen, um, feeling the clothes on your skin or feeling the hair against your face, things like that. Um, three things that you can, um, three things that you can smell. Mm -hmm. Two things that you can, um, let's see. So, so we went with sight, I'm sorry, three things that you can hear two things that you can smell, and one thing that you can taste. Oh, uh, someone beat me to Oh, my own sister beat me to it. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. I'm you going to hand back over to Mrs. Placid. Thank you so, so much. I mean, I feel I could have this presentation for the entire night, but we can't, all right? We need to let you go to your space. It's tremendously, really an awesome session. And in wrapping up our entire discussion, I want to let the audience know that mental health is not a destination. So you don't just get mental health. It's not an event. It is not something that happens. So and mental health in a nutshell is your optimal functionality in society and in, in your space. So if you find yourself not being able to function as normal, it's not that you're crazy, but you may need to talk to somebody to get you back functioning in your space. I, I was recently telling a young woman, declutter. Just like we go to our wardrobes and look for those things that don't fit us anymore. Declutter the dimensions of your life. Evaluate your life and see where you're at. So mental health is not a destination, but a process. 
It is about how you drive for those who drive, right? It's about how you drive, not where you're going. So feed your mind. Our mind matters. The positive thing, getting support, a support system. And one of the things that I champion is self-care, self-care. Even if you have to eat curry, like Mrs. Wellington, self-care. Do something for yourself. I, I, I celebrate my personal holiday, which is a day of nothingness. If you would like to know more about it, check me after. It's a day where you just do whatever you feel to do, even if it's nothing. And you're not too young to do that. Unplug from your devices, young people. Put it away. Your friends are not going anywhere. I know some of you are choking up right now when I say put down the phone or unplug from the internet. But listen, if you want to have optimum functionality in society, remember you're still becoming. Remember you're still growing. Remember we are going somewhere. If you want to do that, you need to take care of your mental health. You need to feed your mind the right things. The same vigor that you would have, that you would be crying when you're having your period. I'm bringing the word back again just to wrap the evening up. And you would want to be going for some sort of medication to relieve your pain. Get help for your mental situation. One closing remark each from each one of the panelists and we wrap up our session. What would you say to the audience this evening? And I want to say to you all, thank you very much. So, Mrs. Theophil, what would you say to our audience this evening? Feel free to share about your book as well. Or if you have anything that's happening in your space, you can feel free to advertise your business, your, your counseling services. Feel free. Anybody, this is your time. No problem. So thank you very much for having me. Um, one of the things that I would end by saying, so my specialty, like my personal specialty is really giving people the opportunity to be encouraged in a way that is practical and very relatable, which is what, my business is built on. I created a product for three years ago called the Promise Jar. And the whole idea behind the Promise Jar is that through four categories, which are scripture verses, affirmations, activities, and quotes, all targeted at one particular topic, you are you now have the tool in your hand to stay encouraged, be empowered, and then inspire others. And um, the reason for that is life has taught me a lot, especially in the past two years that um encouragement and motivation is not they are not light words that we just throw around they really can either make or break you and so all of us really need to strive and find ways to stay encouraged in a way that suits you very well um so be encouraged but make sure they, they, that encouragement is tailored specifically to you make encouragement matter um get encouragement that lasts, whether it be that you get help, what you listen to, what you consume. Um, in terms of my business, the name of my business is Promise Jazz by Kel. Um, so our signature product is the Promise Jar, but we also have an entire clothing line um, as, as well as um, I just released my new book, which is entitled Don't You Dare Back Down, and it's about the strategies of overcoming fear. Um, and that book really is a personal testimony um, to what I have and I am still fighting over the past two years and it really is something that could relate to everybody because fear is one of those um bullies that raise its head very often and cripple a lot of us and all you young women have so much um that the world is waiting for and one of the steps to get past that is learning to watch fear in its face and say listen I had enough of you um so of course if you're interested in getting any of my products you can um, contact me on any of my social media pages. It's a lot easier and a lot faster to go through that. Um, this is my website. Um, so that is Promise Jazz by Kel, Kel with two L's. Um, you can feel free to message me and we can have a conversation and I could tailor a Promise Jar that suits you um, with whatever it is that you're going through in life. So thank you very much for having me. It was indeed a pleasure. Thank you so much for serving with us this evening. Let's hear from Mrs. Asbury. Thank you so much for this opportunity again. It was great, um, great panelists, great ladies. Um, thank you all um, for your feedback and for just everything that you shared into the lives of um, everyone that's on here. Um, I would say whatever I'm gonna leave with, um, with the, the audience is recognize that 
what you, <laughs> this sounds like an ad, but really what you think really matters. Um, and goes back to what um, Kellen just said that it's it's really Kellen just said that it's really important that you recognize what you're putting out there, like what the affirmations that you're speaking and and what other people are are saying to you. Um, that's really important because what you think really matters because your thoughts affect your feelings, and again, your feelings affect your behaviors. Um, there is help. There's always help and there is hope. You don't have to um, allow yourself to, to suffer alone. You don't have to allow yourself to be silent um, in your struggles. Seek help because there is help and there is hope. Um, I do have a book called Impressions of the Mind, What You Think Matters, um, and it can be found on Amazon. Um, it's a therapist's guide to understanding the past. Um, so it digs deep into like our, our early, um, our early, attachments um, and how we how we interact with the world, the different things that we've encountered in our past and how we can heal, give you different tools on how you can heal in the present to maximize your future. Um, it's really important because it targets your mind, how you think and how you can cultivate the feelings that you wanna have and how you can move forward boldly in your future. Thank you so much, Mr. Wellington. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's also been an honor uh, being a part of this panel, a part of this event. I truly enjoyed it. And I really hope that, um, I don't really hope, I know that, you know, persons who are here have been blessed by what has been shared. Um, I think if, if, if something that I would leave is the concept of self, self-care, like you mentioned, and self-compassion. I really am an advocate for self-compassion because partly because it's something that I continue to work on with myself, but I've seen the value in self-compassion. And I just want to share that it has, there are three main steps to practicing self-compassion, um, being kind to yourself, self-kindness, understand, also understanding that we are, we are all human, everybody is on their own mental health journey you are not alone you're not the only one um, who has experienced some, some of what you've experienced everybody has their own their own experiences but there are others who can identify who can understand and who can support and the third part of practicing self-compassion is really mindfulness uh, being in this moment here now we have life now we have opportunity now we have hope now um, what can i do with what i have now am i doing the best for myself am i doing what i deserve am i doing what i to lead to what i hope for my life um, and hence the importance of you know seeking support reaching out to others and also just practicing self-compassion. So when it, those thoughts come up about not being good enough, those limiting beliefs, or if you, you're working on something and you struggle or you, you fail in, in whether it's an exam or anything, just be kind to yourself. Remember that you are human and practice the gratitude and mindfulness, you know, being in this moment and just appreciating all that God has blessed us with in this moment right now. Um, so yeah, my practice you can you can follow me on instagram thriving life therapy um i have my facebook page also where I, on my instagram page mainly where i share tips and, and support um strategies that you know women and young women can use to help them and then you can also contact me on my instagram or facebook page if needed or as necessary so it's it was really wonderful being here and i'm actually looking forward to future opportunities to support so God bless all of you. Thank you so much. And um, our panelists, feel free to drop your social media handles in the chat so that people can get in contact with you. I always let people know that because I myself have a um, counseling, life coaching services, we provide that, but we all can't reach everybody. So why not? Let's share this. Let's help each other. So feel free to put your information in the chat and so that people can connect with you. And last but not least, Shana, would you leave a closing remark for us? First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. I was blessed. I was edified by each of you. The discussion really, really got me thinking. Um, what I would leave with each of you, and I know 
as a teenager, there, there's so much things vying for our attention. And, you know, we feel like you don't have enough time to do everything that you want to do. I want you to know, um, especially to those who, who feel, who don't get the love that they would like from the spaces and the sources that they would like to have it from, regardless of if you, you've been shown that love or if you are being shown it, know that there's somebody greater who loves you and his name is God. He sees every tear. He sees every tear and he hears every prayer. So I would encourage you guys, if you don't have a prayer life, develop one. You, and it doesn't have to be um, long, elaborate prayers that you hear other people praying. You don't even have to pray in tongues. Just tell God how you really feel. He's waiting to hear that. He, he ministers to us where we're at. And that is my story today. Um, I just want to encourage you guys to be your best self take all of what we've said today and use it to become your best self you are on a journey it is not a race just as miss wellington said everybody's mental health journey is different understand that you are unique and you are authentic and you bring something different to the table you bring something that this world has never seen and if you don't do it it cannot be done um, I also encourage you guys to journal, journal, get your sticky notes and stick up your affirmations on your mirrors. I have, apart from my memoir, I have a journal, the Woman on a Mission journal that can be found on Amazon, Woman on a Mission journal by Shannon Fraser. Start there. Even if you don't have anybody to talk to, these pages don't speak. So whatever you write here stays here unless somebody reads it. Yeah, and I hopefully and nobody doesn't read it. And the purpose in your pain, my memoir, is actually I wrote the book. <laughs> it is to bring awareness of my struggles with mental health as a teenager and how God helped me to overcome my painful experiences and using my pain to fuel purpose. I know purpose is a word that we don't necessarily hear. You know, in today's society, because everybody's just with this go, go, go thing and overnight success and you have to get all this money, that's not it. Purpose is peace because as you can see, the, the richest people are now committing suicide. Yeah? It's not, it's not where the money. It's not where the money resides, where they tell us. They tell us, they tell us a lot of lies and we only find out that they're lies too late. But I'm telling you that they're lies. They're lies. You need, you need peace. Yes, you need Jesus. And to those of you who are suffering in silence, there is hope, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I am thankful that God spared my life so that I could be able to be an example amongst many, many other examples of lives that were spared as a result of life's challenges. I just wanna encourage you guys to continue to trust God. Um, my handles, I can be found on Facebook under the name Shannon Fraser. My Woman on a Mission Ministries, that is on Instagram at Woman on a Mission 246, where you can reach out to me and we could actually talk, have a conversation. Whatever you tell me there will stay there definitely. And I also have my business page where you would find all of the things that I sell. Um, woman on a mission underscore enterprises on instagram as well so both my books again can be found on amazon i pray that god will continue to bless each of you and i want to leave this verse that he has laid on my heart and he has been repeating it for quite some time for i know the plans i have for you plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future remember jeremiah 29 11 with god you have a hope and a future. Blessings, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. We know that we have kept you over some time, but I think it was time well spent. And if we start our support group, we won't have to spend so long talking about mental health. We'll be able to support each other. Thank you to everyone who's been here this evening. But I can't close the session without acknowledging the men in our presence. We do have men in our presence. So give them some love. Uh, Mr. Roscoe Robinson, I saw somebody else before, Mr. Wayne Hayward, unless you're using somebody else's name, Mr. John Thompson, 
Um, who else? The men in the group, we welcome you. It's quite fine. It's okay. It's okay. We're here together. Remember, mental health is not a destination. This is a process that you go through. Father, we thank you this evening for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for every person that came this evening. Lord, if there's somebody struggling with their mental health situation right now, God, you direct them to seek help to the right source. Father, that they will not suffer or struggle in silence because there is hope and we can talk about it. We give you praise and we give you honor. Bless us all for the entire week. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Next week, Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, we'll be having the Priceless Foundation Women's Conference Crown Up. It is time that we sit in a place of honor. 3 p.m. You can follow social, our social media page or on um, Instagram to see more details of it. And we climax our month of October with mental health, her health. This is for the vintage ladies. We will be having Dr. Chrissy Doyle Thomas, a neuroscientist who's going to wrap up all our conversation on mental health. Feel free to log on to our Facebook page or Instagram and you'll get more details. Love you much and have a great night. Bye.